here we have Paula. Um, she's been doing Clojure for something like, well, more than nine years. Uh, when I researched what you actually did and what is your public track record, I was like totally in awe because I didn't get like half of it. Um, <laughs> So this is really about showing off uh, technical excellence uh, and uh, from what I understood this is actually a driving force for you wanting to speak. Um, so love to have you here. You gave an interview at Purely, Purely, Purely Functional TV uh, and you said that uh, functional programming as a superhero would have the power to turn back time which is a nice way of stating things. And today, she'll be talking about graph databases. So please give a very big, warm European welcome to Paula Gieren. Thank you, everyone. Um, the microphone seems to be working. Thank you. Um, my talk today is about graph databases. It's more at an introductory level. Um, I've been using graph databases myself for about 18 years, uh, working with them and in them. Uh, so today I'll be explaining a little bit about how they're used and some of the processes about how they work internally. There are lots of different gra database types. Um, the most common out there are the relational databases, which we often call SQL. Um, then we've got the, uh, the other styles which typically get lumped into the NoSQL categories, uh, we have document style databases, we have key value stores, and we have graph databases. Within graph databases, there's a whole family of different things. Now, a really big one, and one that I've worked on for many years, are the RDF Sparkle databases. These are based on a set of standards from the uh, World Wide Web Consortium and they define a data model which is a graph. Uh, the Sparkle query language is specifically uh, about talking to graphs and manipulating them. Most other graph databases follow the same sorts of semantics as this. Uh, one of the most popular ones uh, is Neo4j, which many people who've worked with graph databases have probably heard of. There's TitanDB, which has a lot of support from uh, large corporations like I, uh, IBM, and it's been uh, its purpose is for scaling to the cloud. Then we have Datomic, which I'm sure many people here have heard about. It's created by Rich Hickey in Clojure, and its native interface is for Clojure. Uh, based on Datomic, we then have uh, DataScript, which was written in Clojure Script. Uh, specifically for embedding in your web browser and giving the sort of access to uh, a graph database that Datomic gives you, uh, and doing it all inside memory. At about the same time as DataScript was started, unbeknownst to me, I started Asami, <laughs> and about 18 months later I found out about DataScript, which was very frustrating because I would have just used that if I'd known about it. Um, I'm going to focus on Asami today uh, because Comparing the, the source code for both Asami and DataScript, uh, Asami is a little simpler and it's going to help me to uh, present some of these concepts a little better. But the, the concepts and ideas are still the same. So, why use graph databases? One of the most uh, useful aspects is that they have a very flexible schema. They can, some versions of graph databases even have no schema whatsoever. That's a bit like using records versus maps in Clojure. Um, with records, you predefine what you're expecting to find in there, but maps can be a little more flexible. Um, of course, you know, in more recent versions of Clojure, you can put uh, any extra fields onto a record, but uh, records are really designed to have just these particular fields in them. And graph databases, if they have some sort of uh, schema, uh, are looking for just those fields, but you can add extras often. Uh, they're very suitable for representing complex relationships, and you're able to create uh, ad hoc links uh, in a graph database where you've got things which you weren't anticipating to uh, connecting, and you can connect these things up. And because everything is composable in a graph database, this um, 
uh, allows you to create rather complex relationships very easily. So here's an example of a simple graph of a family. Um, families can have a lot of redundant information in them, like uh, siblings and brothers and sisters, um, like nieces and uncles. And so this graph here isn't complete by any stretch, but it does contain everything we need. So you'll see that the information is represented as a set of nodes, the, these, the green nodes in the graph, and which are all labelled. And then we have links between those nodes, which are also labelled. That's it. That's a graph database. Uh, the fact that the structure is so simple allows us to represent any kind of data at all. And this was proven in the 1970s. So most of the nodes here represent people, but we can also add other kinds of nodes along with additional information that wasn't considered in the original graph. For instance, we could add some information that Christy has a partner who's not a member of the family, and together Christy and, and uh, Clint uh, have a company. Another graph with something a little more complex, we can look at a recipe database. Now, in recipes, ingredients appear as a tuple, which includes measurement units and quantity. Now, each of the tuples rep is represented through an anonymous node. Now, some systems, like RDF, uh, make it impossible to refer to those nodes directly, but most provide some kind of internal label for them. Now, using some of the ideas from the semantic web, data can also be linked to URLs, which lets us to refer to external data as part of the graph. This is particularly interesting when those URLs form nodes in foreign graph databases, like Freebase, and this sort of reference is the foundation of linked data, which is part of the semantic web from W3C. <coughs> OK, let's have a look at an example query. Uh, this here is a datomic query. Uh, this also is the same syntax that both DataScript and Asami use. Similarly to an SQL query, the WHERE clause of the query specifies most of the work. Uh, the major difference is that uh, uh, SQL automatically provides variables bound according to column names from a table. Whereas graph queries use a, a different approach. They have a template based on a triple of entity, attributes, and values to assign variables, uh, variable names to columns. Now, restricting the bindings to the rows that match that template, and filters then get applied to remove any sets of bindings at the bottom there. Um, in this case, the, uh, the binding for Q uh, we're looking for any bindings where that is less than or equal to two. At the end of the query, the variables of interest are the only ones that are kept, and that's declared in the find clause. Now, by way of comparison, a Sparkle query has the same structure as a Datomic query, though with a different syntax. It looks a little more like SQL with select and where, and the filter clause is explicitly labelled. Uh, because XML, XML style namespacing is used a lot, prefix declarations at the top there uh, can, provide it, can make a query much more readable. OK, so having seen that, what are the requirements that a database has to provide? First off, they need to store the data of a graph. If it's to be durable, <coughs> that data will need to be represented in on-disk structures. I'm not going to be looking at that today because that is a very complex topic. Uh, we also saw in queries that they need to find a portion of the data that matches a template pattern. Queries that require a join operation um, also require a join operation where bindings for a variable can be matched. Uh, they need filter operations on results. And an increasingly common set of features uh, includes things like graph analysis, such. Uh, such as uh, traversal and cluster identification. We've also got other operations like uh, <laughs> subtractions and aggregate queries. So graphs are stored in units of a single edge at a time with the two nodes on either end of it. Uh, the node at the start and the other at, at the end of the edge are stored along with the label of the edge, and these form a triple. 
So the basic statement in a graph database is a triple. Now, depending on the system, these may be referred to as entity attribute value, like in Datomic, or subject predicate object, as in RDF, but it all means the same thing. In most systems, these edges are represented along with some metadata, which may or may not be indexed, and that can include identifiers for uh, different graphs, uh, timestamps for when the edge was created, and so on. Uh, so we have a lot of databases which may refer to themselves as a quad store or a five store or things like that. But the statements in the database are a triple, and so even on, on quad store systems, they still refer to triples a lot. Now, getting a little more specific about storage, the best way to meet the needs of matching patterns in a query is to index the triples. Given the simplicity of triples, indices can uh, serve the purpose of also being the storage, uh, though Datomic and DataScript don't do it that way. Uh, Asami does. Uh, while I'm going to stick with Asami and DataScript, one thing that durable stores will usually do is create an index that maps strings <laughs> and URLs and other things uh, to numbers and then map those numbers back to the original data, and it's those internal numbers which get stored as the triple. Okay, so we can look at, now we're going to look at how Asami does this. Asami's currently memory only. Uh, it works in both uh, Clojure and in Clojure Script. Uh, so in Clojure Script, it's going to stick to the in memory only version. Uh, it uses a common practice of nested maps for indexing. Now, in the bottom layer, it uses the, uh, of the standard indexes, and there's more than one type in Asami, uh, it uses sets. So it's a map to maps of sets. Now, there are six possible in, uh, patterns for, uh, for a triple, like ordering entity attribute and value. Uh, we only need three different orderings for indexes. Uh, we'll use the natural three, which includes uh, storing entity first, attribute second, and value last. And the other two that match it are the attribute value entity index and the value entity attribute index. And using those three indices, any pattern can be identified. When reifying with metadata, we'll usually put it at the end and optionally add extra indexing for finding patterns with some given metadata. But I'm going to focus just on the, the main indices without the metadata. Patterns in a query uh, result in lookups in indices. Now, these lookups return a sequence of things uh, that the variables matched on as a sequence of bindings for that variable. Each binding is a vector containing the values for each variable in order. And then some metadata is added to the final sequence uh, containing the names of the variables in the same order. Now, at the bottom here, you can see we've got an example of a binding. It contains the variables name and age. You can see the metadata at the bottom. And the, the bindings, we've got three different bindings. Uh, with the first of each being the name, and the second being the age. So here's a slice of code that accomplishes the index and lookups in Asami. It's not all of it, but it's a, a little bit. Now, the index add function at the top there, as you can see, is just a, uh, a standard call to update in, using the first and the second elements to, to go down into the map, and then the function it uses there simply constructs a set if nothing was there, or conjures onto it if it was. The graph itself is a record containing the three different indices that I mentioned. It implements our graph protocol. Uh, and I have two functions there. The first is graph add, and the second is resolve triple. Now, for the graph add function, you'll see that we uh, just call index add on the first EAV index. And only if that changed do we go on and add the same data into the AVE and the VAE indexes. And you'll see that index add then swaps around the ordering of the values that go in. Now, resolve triple uses a helper function called get from index um, to do the resolution. And we'll look at that now. So the first step is this simplify function at the top. And this simply maps the parameters into uh, a question mark to indicate uh, that a variable appears in that position, or the keyword v 
to indicate that there was a value there. And using that pattern, we can do dispatch onto the multi method get from index. Uh, now, there are eight possible outcomes there, two to the power of three. Uh, I'll just use a, a representative sample here. Um, the first one there with three question marks, uh, that's three variables. That means that you're completely unbound. You're looking for every statement. This is just a nested for loop, and you'll see that it returns EAV for each, um, uh, each entity, each attribute, each value uh, as a vector for the binding, and it'll iterate through the entire index. The second one uh, has a variable in the middle position there. That tells us we want to look up the VAE index, and it, uh, let's see, we look up using the value and the entity, and we're going to get the properties. Um, for each value that's returned, we map vector across it because it might be a single value, but it's still a set of bindings, and each binding has to be in vector form. The next one has two variables. Um, as you can see, we only need to look up the index, uh, uh, the e EDX index there. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, so that's the AVE index is being looked up, and then we iterate. Uh, after looking up the, the attribute, we'll uh, iterate through the values and entities as pairs and return those as bindings. And finally, when we're looking for three values, that's a test for, for the presence of a statement in the database. Uh, in that case, if it's there, we're going to return a binding of a single empty value. Uh, otherwise, it'll be an empty sequence. And that form matches the algebra required for, um, uh, for operations on bindings. OK, let's look at how this plays out. The qu this query asks to find the names of recipes, where the recipe has an ingredient that is flour, measured in cups, where two or few cups are needed. So this shows all of the statements we have in our simple recipe graph. Each pattern in the WHERE clause matches part of the data. First, the names of the recipes. Then, finding the ingredient nodes for those recipes. Finding the nodes which use cups. Getting the quantity. And making sure they're all flour. Filters will iterate over the result just as any closure filter operation does. Now we can resolve the first two patterns and try to join them. First, we find the matching variable, so recipe in this case. Then we expand out the left-hand side, repeating where needed so that everything on the other side is processed with its match. Then we remove the bound things because they're constant. Remove the duplicate, duplicate columns and return that result. Now, join this uh, to the resolution of the next pattern. Find the matches for the bound variables. Only one match on each side, so no repetition needed. Just remove the unneeded bindings. Remove the fixed data, and this is our new result. We keep repeating this. Next pattern finds the quantity. We find the matching ingredient labels. Remove the unnecessary bindings. And remove the unneeded columns. Finally, it only wants the flower, so we find the match. Remove the unneeded bindings. Now that's the result of all the joins. Now I compare that back to the original query. We looked at all the bindings, and we've joined them all. You can see that the filter will pass the single value that was returned, so that's done. Now we just need to handle the find clause. That's just asking for the recipe column. So we remove everything else, and that's done. And that's the entire query answered. So how do we do the joins? Um, while negations, disjunctions, and other operations are all important, the most important operation in a graph database is being able to perform these joins. So this is a basic code for doing that. It doesn't look that basic for a, <laughs> for a slide. Um, 
But to start with, in the, in the let block at the top, you'll see uh, coals are defined, uh, and that's just the columns on the left-hand pattern. Oh, sorry, on the left-hand bindings. And then the total columns, we, uh, we add in the columns that came from the right hand. That pattern left, uh, see we find the matching vars, and that finds uh, index offsets into, um, uh, into each of the bindings uh, column names, so that it's very quick for us to be able to compare things in vectors. Uh, once we've got that set up, we can, uh, we can resolve the final answer. You'll see that there's a for loop here. And that happen the real work happens by iterating over the left-hand side. So the right-hand pattern isn't actually looked up directly in its raw form. Instead, it gets rewritten to use any of the variables that left-hand bindings already has for us. And that new form gets looked up. And a concatenation of the left-hand binding and each of the right-hand results is returned. Uh, now, this is a general enough approach that if no variables matched, then a cross product between patterns uh, will be formed, and that's actually what the math for this operation requires. Um, now, this, when, when needed, we can use cross products, and that'll, uh, th this lets us do any kind of ordering of the patterns, and you'll still get the same result, even if it's going to be less optimized. Uh, finally, we add the, the total columns as metadata. So, other considerations for, uh, for graph databases. We may want to consider the ordering in which we joined things. Uh, in fact, the order that I used in the examples here was specifically less than optimal. It was to show uh, some of the different variations on patterns and how they would join. Um, Unfortunately, when I first wrote the query, I had a look and went, well, this is too simple. It, it, it quickly ends up with a single row which doesn't do much work on the rest of the way through. And that's really what you do want. Um, but how do we find that? Uh, Rich Hickey has specifically made the comment that uh, optimizers work until they don't. And so he doesn't have any sort of query planner in Datomic. DataScript also does not have a query planner. Asami does. Um, unfortunately, what this has meant is that when I'm implementing new features like aggregates, it has made the, um, the query engine a lot uh, more difficult to work inside of because it, the majority of the work goes on inside the query planner and that slowed me down, but I'm working on that right now. Um, we have other option, uh, operations. We've got disjunctions, which is an OR statement. We have uh, bindings where I say I want X at some point to be the concatenation of two strings, for instance. Uh, I can subtract out statements which match something. This is opposed to filtering where we say I do not want uh, statements which have uh, variables which match these other statements in the system. Um, and we have aggregates such as counting and grouping. Durability, which I haven't touched on here, includes things like um, uh, tree indexes on disk, hash tables on disk. Um, it's a very complex topic. Uh, there's a lot of approaches. I've worked in this for many years, especially in RDF databases. Uh, so I'm not going into it here because it is such a big area. But one thing I'd like to point out is that Datomic has taken an interesting approach of abstracting that away and uh, storing everything in key value stores. And the principle there is that Datomic attempts to reproduce the uh, persistent trees that it uses internally in memory, uh, doing it in these key value stores. And that is what allows uh, Datomic to keep its, um, uh, its entire persistent data history. Um, that's not unique to Datomic. Other systems have been doing it for many years. One that I worked on uh, called Mulgara uh, has done that. Uh, and Mulgara in turn was based on uh, file systems uh, from Linux, which, were, uh, which did similar sorts of things. Uh, the difference that Datomic has is that it provides an API which allows you to go back through the history uh, in the case of Mulgara or, or Linux file systems, this was done so that they would have a, um, they could guarantee 
that data would always be consistent, and then once uh, once we'd committed data, we could start removing old data from the system. Datomic specifically does it to keep the history, because we can store a lot more data today than we could in the past. Um, so Datomic's API over this is, is very useful, and DataScript also exposes it. Um, Asami at this point does not. Okay, um, that's the end of the talk. Uh, what I've shown you here is just the very basics to get a graph database going, but it should give you a little idea of what's going on inside the system. What I hope for is that you're able to use this to decide if a graph database may meet your needs in future and to understand what it's doing so that you can compare it to other systems. Um, I've got a couple of links here, uh, including the Asami project, as well as DataScript. And if you look in there, you'll see some elements that are different. For instance, uh, DataScript stores datums as records and indexes them separately. But the ideas are still very similar. And thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have take questions from the audience? Certainly. Certainly. Do we have questions in the audience? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. Um, can you use Asami on top of like an existing graph database, or is just uh, mainly focused for in-memory graphs? Or maybe like how easy it would be to repurpose for you know for J or something like that. So it is designed specifically to be a database itself. It does have a protocol, um, which you would have seen on a previous slide, called Graph, and that's really just uh, an index which will, um, which can be queried to do the lookups. It does its joins itself. You, you could put that graph protocol, protocol across any kind of storage, including a graph database. Uh, a lookup then would simply be resolve a single pattern, but there's no, um, there's no protocol or abstraction for performing joins. That's done ent entirely within Asami. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, really interesting. Uh, I'm curious to hear about uh, challenges you faced while building Asami and you know, how Clojure may have helped you or hindered you when trying to solve those, and if you would like use Clojure again if you had to redo it, um, you know, what trade-offs? Yeah. I have redone it uh, several times. So <laughs> I, the first system I made um, became a commercial store. Our third attempt became a commercial store, um, which we then open sourced, it was called Kawari, and then, and then that became Mulgara. And I worked on that for nearly 10 years, and that's an RDF store, but all the principles are the same. Um, I was looking for something in memory, and so I implemented something in Java, and the, the type system for what can go into each column kept getting in the way, but I worked my way around it. I moved to Scala, which helped a lot, but I had a lot of redundant code. Um, so what, that's four or five attempts at that point. And then I did it <laughs> in... Uh, th this latest one, I did not want to create another database. And I was doing a rule system which used graph databases. And my manager said, oh, we should just do an in-memory one. How about you just do it? Just do it in, in Clojure. And I said, can't I use something like Datomic, please? And no, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and thus Asami was born. Um, it has been the easiest of all of them so far. Um, it, the, uh, the persistent memory structures were very easy to work in. I said that I showed you a slice and I did. The entire index code is about twice of what I showed on that slide. Uh, the, it is so pleasant and easy to work in. DataScript has added a lot of extra layering and abstraction which I found a little confusing for a talk of this length. Um, but the, the way that Asami came together was very nice. Uh, working, the, the query planner is 
rather complex. Uh, I needed dynamic programming for that. Um, I'm not sure if another language would have helped there. I've only done a query planner before in Java, uh, and it's definitely much, much easier. I can keep it all on one page, but it's still, uh, it's st still a complex task. Uh, perhaps uh, Haskell or Scala may provide some um, benefits there, but doing it in Clojure has been really quite a pleasure. More questions? Uh, another one. <laughs> Since it's on uh, GitHub uh, as an open source project, would you say like it's production ready? And if it's uh, and um, because it's open source. Do you need help or like are looking for contributors or what's the direction of it? I would love to have contributors. It'll make me look better for my manager. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was very kindly allowed me to open source everything I was doing here. It is, um, I don't know what production ready means. Uh, it is currently deployed as part of a uh, system called Threat Response which if you look on the front page of cisco.com, you'll see that uh, we have software for detecting um, uh, network threats and responding to them. Uh, it's, it, it has a, a graphical user interface with graphs on the, uh, on the page. All of the information in that page is being stored in Asami. Um, and at the moment, we have a couple of thousand uh, customers who are using threat response and uh, the company is doing really well with threat response and so that's the first time I've ever been involved in a project that's had such wide distribution and it's really nice to see. Um, so from that perspective I could say that it's um, uh, that it's ready <laughs> but I mean every system has issues and problems and could do more um, and yeah, anyone who wants to look at it, I'd, I'd love contributions. I think that's good, nice final words. <laughs> thank you. Um, so once again, thank you. <laughs>